get the live stream going here ahead of game a little bit. No, you're actually early tonight. What happened? I don't know. I guess I must have my shit together. I don't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> don't don't put that label on yourself don't, don't tell anybody. that's a lot to live up to <laughs> yeah i was gonna say don't tell anybody because i'm sure it's not going to be very long lived. <laughs> I, I i i know how these things tend it's to work be very long lived. <laughs> all right well let's see let me go ahead and get the phone number up here right. and okay so now this is where hold on i gotta Hang on, let me disappear just a moment here. Okay, no worries. We're still a minute in front of ourselves keys. right now. So. Yeah, keys. Oh, we're there. Where's the keys? Oh, the they're, they're still on the table. Oh, okay. Right. I'll see you live about there tomorrow. All right. I'll see you Your soon. Your will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Long short radio. All right, we're just about there, but we're ahead of the game here. We got the live stream going. I've already heard from the lady in the box. And did you notice all the uh, little icons on the bottom of the Zoom screen are all different? It did another update on me. Yeah. yeah Chad just, is no longer in there. Just when you think that you know how it works, they go and change everything. Yeah, now there's no chat. Um. Well, I think if you go to more, and then there's a chat right there. Oh, you got it. They just show shoved, chat previews. They just shoved it into the more section. Oh, there it is. Yep. Wow. So you found out the hard way already. Yeah, yeah. They it updated right in the middle of a yeah, yeah. They it of a deal right here. Right so all right now. Oh, that's not good. Hold on here. We're getting. A little looping here. We can fix that. All right, everybody. We got some people on the line already, and uh, Stephen, and Jamie, and Matt. I'm glad to see you guys made it in, and uh, we're gonna try to get started pretty much on time right now. And wow. I'm I'm still figuring out this working off of the phone, but it's kind of cool. So, just so anybody knows, before we do the official intro for the show. If you pop onto the show, I have the ability now to bring you up onto the Zoom, I think, directly from the live stream. I mean, not on the Zoom, but onto the live stream. So I don't know that that's going to help Craig because he's not on the live stream directly, but I could talk to you and we can see each other. Jeff, how's it going? So if you want to come on to the show, what you'll have to do, here's how it's going to work. If you say, hey, I'd like to pop in for a second, you either can call the phone number and 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 call in, but then that makes you a disembodied voice, which is fine if that's the way you want to go. But if you want to be part of the video conference, which is even better, just let me know. And then I think what you have to do is you'll have to go out and then come back in. And then it gives me the opportunity to bring you onto the video. And our guest is here, so that's good. And so, anyways, we've got a great guest today and, um, and an incredible story, another heartbreaking story, which unfortunately has been the ongoing topic of this show for the last 10 years. But um, that's why we're out here doing what we're doing is to help the folks that are going through the heartbreaking stories. So anyways, give me a second. I still can't do two things at once very well. So I'm going to put up the phone number. 515-602-9684 to call. Or just listen. Hang on, Kelly. We're almost there. Uh oh, Kelly went from nice and bright to, well, a little dark. There. <laughs> now you're nice and bright again. Okay. It looks like you have a halo as well. Uh, well hey, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> 
It's uh, Angelic Kelly here with us today. Um, all right. So, Jeff, I don't know. I I got one person saying they had a blackout on the screen, but I don't have a blackout on my screen. So I think it's just you. Um, all right. So we're doing two things at once here, three things at once. So we're we're doing one podcast, going out in three different places. And so I'm going to lay out the ground rules here. Welcome to A Cup of Joe. This is a podcast brought to you by the Human Solution International. And uh, we are here to talk about all things life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And most importantly, no one should be going to jail for a plant, not any plant, especially not the cannabis plant. And uh, we're here to help those people that are that are engaged in our uh, legal system. We're here to help the people that have been victims of the drug war and have been incarcerated. We're here to encourage people to step up and stand up and help us fight for your rights and uh, especially fight for your own rights. You know, it's it's real easy if we all just stood up and uh, fought for our own rights. I guarantee you this whole mess would have been over a long time ago. And so it's because of people like myself and Craig and Kelly and Bob and so many other people that have stood up and said, hey, hold on now, this is not okay. And uh, I'm not gonna comply with your silly little rules that say I can't do these things. Um, and if I did them, I shouldn't be punished for doing them when all I was doing was helping some folks. Um, that's really what this is all about. So. Uh, this is a podcast, so we can be colorful if we need to. There's not any, uh, you know, I try to keep the show pretty much PG, but, um, you know. You, well, you scared me. You started out saying that you were going to lay out the rules. Yeah, and I well, thought we only rule. had one rule is that there is no rules. <laughs> well, that's pretty much it. The rules are really one rule. Don't be disrespectful. And really, in 10 years of doing this show, I have literally invited those people who hate me to come on the show and let's talk about it. And um, I, and of course the people that like me, but most importantly, the people that stand with us in our efforts to support each other. That's really what I would really care to talk about. And uh, those people that have showed up have always been respectful. Like I've never really had to throw anybody off the show for being an asshole. And I don't know why it is, but I am glad because that's not the kind of show I like to run. I like to run a show where we can communicate effectively and um, everybody gets a voice. And if you don't agree with me, that's OK. Let's talk about it. Maybe you'll learn more about my point of view or maybe I can learn more about your point of view. Um, but communication is key. And I believe that if we communicated effectively with our government, and our representatives, and our law enforcement, and our judicial system, I think we would not have the problems we have. But most of the time, when we get caught up in a problem, we roll over and comply and take a plea deal and say, well, I guess I must have done something, so I'll just say okay, so I don't have to go to jail. And then they keep doing what they've always done, and we keep doing what we've always done, and we complain and whine and bitch about it, but we don't do something different. And every once in a while, Somebody stands up and says, hey, wait a minute, uh, that one's not OK. Uh, you're not going to do that to me and you're not going to do that to my friends and family and you're not going to do that to um, anybody if I can do anything about it. And if we can get enough people to stand up and have a conversation about that, I think things can change. So, Craig, how are you doing today? Before we get to Kelly, I want to introduce my co-host, Craig, who, if you don't know, we got a lot of new listeners on the show, and I'm really grateful for that. And I want to bring you all up to speed real quickly. Um, I'm Joe Grumbine. I'm the head of, this, of the Human Solution International. I've been fighting for freedom most of my life, but I had a case um, that ended almost 10 years ago, and I fought it for six years, got locked up five times um, to multiple felony cases and ultimately came out victorious um, and not because of luck, because of staying with it and doing everything I could every day, all the time, including creating this show and The Human Solution. And so it worked for me. It's worked for a lot of people. And so we're taking what we've learned and we're helping other people with it. Along the way, we met Craig, who was languishing in federal prison, serving a life sentence for pot. Um, and he was uh, about halfway through the amount of time that I've known him 
serving. So I've known him for oh, about 10 years. He had already served about eight or nine years by when I met him. And uh, just uh, just under two years ago, I think it was, uh, he got out and it, in no small part because of all the effort that all the people that have stood with us have helped to cause. Craig, how are you doing today? Good, good. And as you pointed out, I've been incarcerated as a first time offender since the beginning of 2002 on a marijuana charge. Marijuana conspiracy was the name of the charge. They said that I help people that use their trucks to haul marijuana. But they sentenced me to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Now, a lot of the people I met in prison were murderers, and they had a whole lot less sentence than I did. And uh, so that was a little alarming right off. But what was more alarming is 10 years after I was in, and I, I got no mail, pretty much everybody forgot about me. And a volunteer from the Human Solution sent me a letter. And they sent me a picture of themselves and they say, you know what, we've heard your story, we know about you, hey, can we help you, can we work with you, Let, let's get together. And that, that's that been a, a marriage that we, we've been in, engaged with ever since. We all said and, yes. <laughs> and yes. we started working together. And, and uh, just days after that, I got invited to your Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> at your house. And yep. they passed around a cell phone I had called to all kinds of people around the table. <sighs> yeah, that was actually a very momentous day because um, I, I had gotten out of lockup for lack of a better term, um, not that long after that or before that and um we were just really getting engaged with this prison outreach program and we had made contact with i don't know a couple of dozen mostly lifers but a lot of different people people that we had been supporting that got caught up in a federal case and and had gotten locked up we had i don't know probably 20 or 30 people that we were in contact at that point and thanksgiving had come along and the previous thanksgiving i was locked up and i was like man that sucked balls and and i really didn't want to but experience that ever again but then i thought about all the guys we just met i'm like wow the one thing that the guys in prison don't have is anybody to share their thanksgiving with aside from the bonehead sitting next to them in their cell and and you're already done with that and so we said well i, I made an, an invitation on the Cora links i says hey I'm going to be uh, having a gathering at my place on Thanksgiving, and I'd sure love to share 15 minutes of it with you. And I uh, coordinated the calls, and and throughout the whole evening, we had uh, uh, inmates calling in, and, and we had 15 or 20 people over sharing our meal, and we passed the phone around, and everybody got a chance to talk to these guys. And actually, what happened out of it was we, we created some staunch advocates because they were able to actually communicate in real time with real words with these people and it became real to them you know it's one thing to see a a two-dimensional face it's one thing to see an article but when you're actually talking to the person and you hear the you're you're on the phone with a federal inmate you know you're the, the this college from a federal prison yeah the, the, the constant recording and it's that the, the clatter in the background and the the reality of that really settles in i get chills just thinking about it because it wasn't seems like it was just yesterday and uh you don't ever forget it you don't ever lose the it doesn't ever lose its sting and i i think that we changed our course because of that night and and we really started taking the prison outreach a lot more seriously putting a lot more effort into it and here we are 10 years later we're still doing it and um you know a lot of the guys that we were supporting have been released and that's fantastic and a handful of those guys are still helping us and uh and that's okay whatever we can get we'll take and um we're we're not going to quit until we're done and um we were talking a few weeks ago, and uh, one of our listeners brought you up, Kelly. And I don't know, I think I had heard about your story before. You know, it's uh, unfortunately, hey, Josiah, holy cow, 
people are coming back from the from the netherworld we remember josiah from uh shoot from the east coast the the advocates that were going hardcore out there they just came came back in watching so this is great um Hillary. but i want to hear what's happened to kelly what yeah, what's yeah, brought yeah, her yeah, into absolutely. the justice system which is a horrible abyss <laughs> well and kelly i came to the show through one of our listeners and i heard about the story and by the time i heard about it you guys were already being sentenced and um, i had the good fortune though to come on to your call uh your your planning call and uh i was so blown away by by the work you guys were doing in fact i think i pointed it out to you you guys were working right out of our playbook and we had never talked before so uh kelly welcome to the show i'm glad that you're able to to talk today um and i'm glad that you've you know gotten another month before i, I don't know if i'm glad or not i think i'd rather just see it be over because i think right. I know how it's going to play and i know how it feels i i'm i'm living what you're living right now because i've gone back to my between being convicted and sentenced and those were the most tense four weeks i think of my life because every day i was one day closer to what might happen and you just didn't know and and you know even though they said well you're gonna be okay i'm like yeah that's easy for you to say but uh the prosecutor certainly didn't think so so why don't you tell us a little bit about your story um we, we've got a lot of new people on the on the show what li listening watching and uh many of them don't know who you are well my name's kelly um i live in it's cartersville georgia we're northwest of atlanta so basically an exurb of atlanta and um back on march 29th of 2018 it was uh the thursday before easter and i was here my homeschool my son and we're like semi homesteaders and we, we've always been big do-it-yourselfers and um on that day my dog one of my dogs was at the vet having surgery and i was fixing to go pick her up and i had dog biscuits in the oven that I was making for them. And I had like a pot of yogurt. I had just all kinds of stuff going on. It was springtime, just, you know, things were in a lot of transition here at our house. And I was in the restroom getting ready to go pick up my dog. And I hear this loud noise at the front door. And I was like, what is that? And I thought my husband had gotten off work early and was locked out. I mean, I didn't know. I've never heard anyone banging on my door like that before. And it's like within just a, a, I don't even know how much time went by, like a few seconds, I came out of the bathroom and I get in and there's all these cop, cops in here with guns pointed at me, telling me to get down on the ground. I've got five dogs. They're pretty big. And the first thing I said was, please don't shoot my dogs. Cause there had just been an incident in the state of Georgia where some cops had killed a dog. And, um, and I said, my son's upstairs cause we homeschool. So please don't shoot him either. And although they did go up there and point a gun at him too, so um they proceeded to just totally ransack and destroy our house that we've lived in since 2000 we're homeowners we're not renters and um just stomped everywhere all over everything and said you know we have a warrant for your arrest for i don't even remember hearing them say that they had a warrant i was just in a daze like what the hell is going on right now and um so they took me cuffed me and um started interrogating me and everything and um they i've always had this thing where like i'm going to talk like if there's ever a criminal perpetrating an act on me i'm going to try and talk them out of it and that's the situation i felt that i was in at that time and so i told right. I, I told them more than i should have told them and that's the one thing i regret was not saying nothing at one point i did say there's nobody here to represent me i don't really want to say anymore but um but for some reason, I thought, okay, I'm going to talk them out of of doing this, you know. Let me but stop just for one second, Kelly, because what you're sharing is something that I did myself. And and I think a lot of people that are in our situation, which is, we didn't do anything wrong. So right. if I could just right. get you to understand what you're seeing, because I know it might look like to the untrained eyes, something that somebody might have been doing wrong, it's not in my case. And let me just explain to you what's going on so maybe you can understand and leave me alone. But the problem is 
we didn't remember our rule number one, which is shut the F up. Right. And, and I, I, I'm guilty of it. And, and so many people that have gone through cases and then it's just like they say, they use everything you said against you. Yeah, they really do. And, um, and yeah, and in the interview, I told them, I'm like, I believe cannabis is a medicine and, and I don't call, I never called it. I hate the word marijuana. I understand the history of it. I don't use that word. And throughout the whole interview, you know, I was like, cannabis is a medicine and, and anyone who gets it from me is, is using it as medicine. And, and so that was, you know, I, and I was telling the truth about all that. And, um, and then they, they, so they arrested my husband on his way home from work, which they didn't even have a warrant for him. There was like some procedural things there that didn't seem right. You know, just they lied to us during the interviews, but apparently that's okay because that's what they get to do. Cops get and, to do um, that, but we don't. Right, yeah, right. The Supreme so, Court actually approved it. They lie and lie and lie, but we have to be honest. And it's right. just, I'm so over the double standards, but. But it's justice. Yeah, yeah. And then and then in the meantime, like they're sitting there, a couple of the cops are like, hey, this is really good stuff. Have you ever thought about moving out to Colorado where you could do it legally? You know, and just like I'm like, yeah, why don't you leave and we'll leave and we can pretend this never happened, you know, right. and and um, and then one of them sitting on the front porch talking to me about raising chickens. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? You know, I'm just it was such so bizarre. Just the whole thing was so bizarre. <laughs> And then I was worried about what was going to happen to my son and my dogs and just everything, you know? So they ended up taking my dogs to the pound, but fortunately my oldest son was able to go and get them out that Monday. So they had to stay there for a weekend, but they got out. They took my younger son, cause my children are eight years apart. They took my younger son to, um, to the foster care facility for the night because they couldn't find anywhere for him to go. So he had to go there for a night and then he went to my parents and then he went um, to a friend's house and stayed there until we got him back and we got him back pretty quickly and juvenile court was like, oh, we've never seen a family get their act together this quickly. And we're like, yeah, because we didn't have a problem until you came knocking on my door, you know, and right. we didn't have anything to get together. It, there was, you know, anyway. It, it, it's so, called regular people doing reasonable things and living a regular life and one of those things we do just doesn't happen to fit your definition of that and everything yeah. else we don't act like criminals because we're not it's no really no and that's like they were like are there any booby traps and, and they started asking they were like using terminology i never heard of. i think they were asking me if we were making carts because at the time the carts were kind of new on the scene and and um i'm talking about the concentrates and the cartridges you know and um and I was like no I don't know you know I'm like there's no BB traps there's no camera system there's I'm like we're not whatever you think we are you know right. and um so they took us to jail and because it was um it was Easter weekend so Superior Court was out like the whole next week and so we stayed in jail for 13 days waiting to get out on bond and um apparently I was the girls in jail and me told me that we were lucky because you know not too long long ago superior court only came around every six months so who knows how long we could have been in but um we finally got out and um and like i said we got our son back of, you know about i guess maybe two months later and um and then we just played the waiting game we got we had one attorney who got us out on bond and we were told by um other people they were like get rid of him he's the you know he's not he, he was good for getting us out but that was it you know he's not who we wanted to represent us then we got a guy off the normal site who was very enthusiastic and you know and we thought oh this guy's great and everything but he just kind of strung us along and you know often didn't show up in court and one of his associates who did show up in court got jailed on contempt because he didn't show up when he was supposed to wow and so we were feeling kind of helpless and um Fortunately, I met Sharon Raven. I've heard you mention her. This is a state case. So for anybody who is hung up on, you know, well, this or that, this is what should be just a, a very simple to nothing sort of a deal. And, and I get it, Kelly. I was locked up in the uh, Hall County, uh, Georgia jail oh, okay. for yeah. 21 months. And I went to court in Gainesville, Georgia. Yep, yep. That's where they pronounced the life sentence against me for marijuana. Yeah. Um, 
Yep. So, so yeah, so you, you probably have heard Cartersville is pretty similar to Gainesville, not quite as big, but um, similar demographic and everything. And so, so through, I, so I met Sharon Raybert because like it was December of 2018, the second attorney we had who told us he was going to drag it out as long as he could, all of a sudden was like, no, uh, you're going to have to do this plea deal and you're going to go to jail and they've got a good case against you and they know it. And, and I was like, damn. And so that's how we spent our whole Christmas was thinking about all this, but fortunately right. through, through Sharon Raver, um, yeah. Sharon's awesome. If, if anybody is. doesn't know who Sharon Raver is, I think she, she just stepped down a couple of years ago because she ran for office and, uh, she had some health issues going on with her daughter and whatnot, but, um, she she ran Peachtree Normal for I don't know how many years and just an incredible advocate and she had her own case and it was another horrible case and I've spent time with her in Georgia um, a couple of times and we got together in Colorado and and just a great you were fortunate to have connected with her for sure oh yeah very very fortunate um she's the how we met Catherine uh, Bernard, who is currently our attorney, and her partner Alex Johnson is representing Dan. And um, Catherine took time out of her day on New Year's Eve, uh, 2018, and met with us in her office. And we spent like a couple of hours in there just talking to her on a consultation. And she, you know, the whole way she laid out that she was going to approach the case was the way that I had it in my head that it should be the whole time. And anytime I'd bring up any of my ideas to our previous attorney, he'd look at me like I was crazy, you know, and I'm like, okay. So, so once we got with Catherine, um, I felt so much more hopeful and like, okay, finally things are going to go our way. And we, I guess we got into 2019 and I started having health problems, which I know are directly related to the PTSD that I suffered from this incident and um, ended up having to have pretty intensive surgery in October of 2019 and was on therapy for uh, IV therapy for uh, a couple of months trying to clear up an infection. So all of that delayed our case. We got continuances. And then, of course, the court shut down in 2020, which for me, and just this is going to sound selfish or whatever, but I was like, hey, bring on the pandemic, whatever, because it totally got us off the hook. And it was like a big snow day for us, basically, right. as far as the courts and everything were concerned. So we were um, just, you know, kind of in a state of waiting for a long time. And then we kept we're getting still on bail, though. So yeah. You know, for yeah, everybody who doesn't realize, like I was on bail for six years straight and they violated my bond in time, almost violated it two other times. And when they violated it, that's when they locked me up and doubled my bond. They had me out on quarter million dollars and 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 my charges were put. And that's a thing that people don't necessarily get, because when you're on bail, you're literally in a world that you have no control over because the judge, the bail bondsman, the prosecutor, everybody has influence on your freedom except you. Mm -hmm. And if you do anything that they consider to be a violation of anything, they can just, boom, sorry, forfeit your bond and, and whatever they decide to do. And so yep. that is one of the most tense living situations you could ever experience maybe even almost more than being sentenced because at least in your sentence you can come to terms with it but this is just the anvil hanging right over your head from right. 20 stories up and at any moment it could drop on you yeah you've got well no unfortunately a federal charge you you're not even eligible for bail Right. Unless right. you're a, a gov unless you're cooperating with the government in the prosecution of others right wow. that's actually written in the statute yeah yeah it's brutal yeah it is it's very uh and just and people don't understand you know because like we used to go to concerts all the time and just you know all kinds of stuff and people still be like oh let's go do this let's go do that and i'm like i i'm <laughs> paralyzed i can't do anything you know i i just i can't be in any situation that's going to put me in danger of you know going back to jail it was just right. not something i wanted to deal with so i since then have become very introverted and very much a homebody and that's not really like me but it's just it's it's kind of what we had to do and Survival. um and you know we made the best of it and fortunately my our youngest son still lives here with us and my other son lives close by so i still get to see my family and my mother um well my father was alive he died in april 21 so i was still able to see my parents and and everything but 
I mean, it was really walking the straight and narrow and still it, I mean, we still have to be, you know, just like, it's basically like you're on probation already. And that's something that we're hoping the judge is going to take into account that we've been living this way for um, over five and a half years now. And it, it, I think hopefully that will account for something in her eyes. And, you know, the, the pre-sentencing interview, at least mine, they still recommended jail time, but you know, whatever, that's just their, their statist and they believe in the system and whatever. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of what it's been. I mean, it's been, um, well, it's like, you can't even explain to people what it's like. I mean, there's nothing like, it's, it's like, if you have a, a, a terminal, or I mean, if you have like a, a chronic illness or something like that, it, people are very sympathetic and, you know, oh, and they try to help you and everything, but it's like stuff like this is people just look at you, you know, and unless they've been through it, they, they just, yeah. you know, kind of step back and, you know, and it's, I don't know. So one thing that I experienced and I, and I, I like to compare experiences if I could, when it happened to me, I had I had a lot of people that I knew that I were my friends, people I've kn known for years and years and years, family. Um, a lot of people distanced themselves from me when this happened, when they found out I got locked up. All of a sudden, you know, loved ones, friends for many, many years. I can't really hang out with you anymore. Or mostly they didn't say anything. They just kind of took a step back. And then what happened was it was kind of strange people that I didn't know, but people that I was, you know, now in this new world of advocates and activists jumped in people that didn't even know me, but they, they, they shared some knowledge of the situation or they had somebody that they had gone through at the time we were helping a lot of other people too. So we created almost a whole new family. And it was really bizarre. Like I'm looking around at all these people that were supporting me. And I'm like, I don't hardly know any of you. And then you think about all the people you know, and where are any of them, you know? And I don't know if you shared that experience, but it was pretty surreal. Yeah, it was, um, I, I, most of our close friends were friends, like we're into um, like, well, the prosecutor, even when he was asking the potential jurors, he was like, do you like the band's widespread panic and fish? And, you know, and because my husband and I met after a Grateful Dead show in 1990. So, you know, that's kind of our thing. Right. And because of that circle that we're in, they're not judgmental at all of right. what we went through and, and have been extremely sympathetic and um, is, you know, started raising money for us. As soon as we were in jail, they started trying to help us, got tons and tons of letters, you know, so. So my friends definitely did not abandon me at all. Yes. And, and and I still tell, I'm so grateful to them for that. And it's it's not their fault that we don't get to see each other because we'd see each other when we were traveling on the road and it shows and, you know, stuff like that. Right. And we chose not to go back into that lifestyle. So that's why we haven't seen so many of those people. But, um, but they have been there for us virtually. Now, my parents actually surprised me. My dad, especially, was very supportive. And- oh, good. Um, yeah, he, he, cause you know, they took both our vehicles. And so, um, he immediately got us a car so Dan could get back and forth to work. And then he, he gave me a car a little while later. So, um, he was very, very supportive. My mother still is, uh, she just, you know, she still gets stuck on the fact, well, it was illegal. And, you know, I'm like, mother, you would have had, you would have been there cheering on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the way you're acting, you know, because he was acting against the state too, right. but she, she just can't wrap her head around it. And um, right. so, and then my extended family didn't really know what now right. they do because I've been posted on Facebook about it and stuff. But, um, but people who I would call acquaintances and things like that definitely, you know, have kind of fallen off the radar and, and, um, but we've had other support that character witnesses, um, the test took the stand for us, you know, uh, from my the lady who lives in my neighborhood, whose child was friends with my son, you know, and so people who, that maybe I wouldn't have expected to really, it came through for us as well, but there's always that group that kind of are like, oh, you know, and, you know, so it's, it's kind of a mixed bag, but, but we have had some good support. So, um, and then Hannah Cox wrote an article about us that went in the, um, foundation for economic education and we got some support from that. And, um, you know, anyone who's libertarian minded, uh, at all sees the, the foolishness in all of this. Right. And, um, 
and is very supportive, but, but it still isn't like, I, I have very few friends who actually can fully understand what we have been through, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Well, so I, I got to meet your attorney on a video conference a couple of weeks ago. And I can't say enough praise um, on her behalf. Um, she's everything I would want an attorney to be based on the short time I had to spend with her. Um, just just committed, smart, uh, creative, um, you know, gutsy, all of those things that um, most attorneys don't have yeah. and um willing to 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 put the effort in i mean i don't know how many attorneys like you said the first ones are typical of most people most people's cases paid or public defenders it doesn't matter um they just they they they, they stuck in first gear and they don't really have any reason to get out and um you know catherine is just like boom she's She's engaged and um, and and sounded like she listened to your thoughts. And, um, you know, I had an attorney that was like that for a period of time and then he got a little weird, but at least for a period of time, he was real helpful. And so, um, you know, for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the experience of actually going through a trial? Again, people just don't know, you know, when you go through these, these cases, you're going your whole life gets put on hold and your opposition which is the state is just going to work and nothing changes yeah. they're going to their regular job doing their regular right. thing every single day and they don't have you're nothing special to them for our side of it everything stops your whole life is upside down and it's it's literally you know uh, an, an alternative universe that everything will go wrong if anything happens outside of you just walking that thin and narrow line. Yeah. And then when you're going through court, you know you you got dealt a pandemic, but I didn't have a pandemic, and mine still took six years. And so it's it's a it's a whole process of continuances, and this person didn't show up in 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 court, especially in state court anything doesn't happen and it just gets continued so you got to think of all the moving parts you got the judge you got the bailiffs well the bailiffs are interchangeable um the prosecution the defense counsel and anybody has anything and then the defendant anybody has anything go off and oh we gotta we need to continue because of whatever so the amount of continuances and in my case i had to drive 100 miles to court and and in southern california you know that's a two to three hour drive each way and um most more often than not it was get all the way in there and then oh it's continued and then fight the traffic back home and you know your whole day is ruined and nothing happened and of course all the anxiety and stress of yeah. what might and could happen and uh you know and then you go through all these procedural hearings and you get a, a preliminary hearing where they decide if it's going to go to trial. Mostly it almost every time it does. But then you'll have these procedural or motions being filed or, you know, whatever. And and, and then finally you get to, OK, well, we're going to be uh, in the jury. And why don't you tell us a little bit about that process? Because if you haven't been through it, you don't know how it is. It's not like. You see in the movies it's it's you know a hundred x for any single person no matter what the charges are no matter what your situation there's nothing more stressful than sitting in a courtroom having to select a jury that's going to decide the outcome of your freedom right right yeah that yeah it, it was uh it was bizarre and i had gotten to the point where i was like i don't even think we're going to go to trial because it just kept going and going and going and and we were at the point where, you know, most municipalities would it would have offered us like really good plea deals or whatever, you know, by five and a half years into it. But apparently the governor in our state put out a mandate um, a while back, about six months ago or so, telling all district attorneys that they had to prosecute all the cannabis cases. Wow. So, uh, yeah, he's a big, you know, I can't stand our governor. But um, they, uh, so... 
the, our attorneys always had the impression this prosecutor didn't even really want to try our case, but I guess he felt that he had to, or or he or not felt he had to, but was told he had to. So we we finally went in, and there were incarcerated cases that were supposed to be before us, but they put us at the front of the list um, this time. So we went in um, August 28th and started the jury selection. And of course, the people that we really liked that we wanted on the jury were struck by the state. And um, we ended up with a jury that was, you know, there were a couple of people on there I had concerns about, but um, all in all, it seemed like it was a pretty good group of people. And um, there were 14 total and they didn't tell the alternates who were the alternates. They were just all in there together the whole time. And, um, and it was, it's a, the courtroom is set up differently. Like the jury sits in the middle instead of on one side, like most courtrooms are. Really? And, um, and so at first we were like, that's going to be intimidating for them. But as time went on, we kind of, the, they liked it better. Our attorney, they being our attorneys said they liked it kind of better with them being in the middle like that. So, um, so we ended up, um, it, I think the jury selection took about a day and a half. And they finally, um, they did the opening statements and everything. And the, you know, I just, I don't want to say too much about the prosecutor, but I mean, I just, I used to think cops were the worst, but now I decided prosecutors are the bottom of the barrel. They really are. I could tell you some stories about a prosecutor that would yeah. curl your milk. I mean, I'm telling you, it, it's, they're, they're an interesting breed, especially when, you can tell they're ambitious. So for people that don't realize the, the course of politics, prosecutors, if they're successful, end up being judges. And they work their whole career to create a record that sets them up to be appointed as a judge uh, when, when a vacancy happens. And, and it's just the way it is. And so a lot of them, I'm not saying they're all that way. I've actually met a couple of prosecutors that were actually reasonable and and saw reason at one point but most of them are just there's not many of them that's for no, sure no no most of them are just career minded got to get that win and they they push for the plea deal because that's their easiest win but if they got to go to trial man then they pull out all the dirty tricks like in the cartoons you know none of these and none of those and none of these and and that's all they do is these and those it's yeah. crazy yeah, and from from what I've heard to prosecutors, the, the the people who end up being prosecutors are usually the the attorneys that couldn't get jobs anywhere else, and basically, you know, just that's what they had to do, what the what, what they resorted to, and um, so he like he was even asking the the jurors like, have you ever invested in cannabis? And I'm like, you're sitting here talking about how you because he admitted that he had invested in stocks in 2020. And I'm like, okay, so you can uh, invest in it and right. that's okay for that. But what I was doing with it is not okay. And, you know, right. because it really is all about money. That's what it all comes down to is money yeah. and revenue for these, for all these municipalities. So, um, so once we got the jury picked, we ended up, um, the, all the state had, because the witnesses, did, the, the confidential informant who said, us, and that's, I, I forgot to tell that part about it. The, um, the guy who did this to me was a quote friend of mine that I knew through farmers markets and he he worked for different farmers and I'd buy strawberries and peaches and different stuff and I'd known him for years and uh, his mom had cancer and he asked about cannabis for her you know and I think he even brought up Rick Simpson oil and I was trying to tell him you know yeah you can do that or you can do this you know and everything and um so he, in the meantime, died of a fentanyl overdose back in September 2020. So they didn't have any actual witnesses. And um, so all they had was, was, was the cops, the, the cop who led the raid, and then a couple of the other ones who tested uh, the cannabis for THC presence. And um, so they basically sat there for about it felt like ever for like three days on the stand going over and over and over the 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 grow lamps they brought in all the equipment and the tents 
and the bags that like like because we kept everything in paper whole foods bags and so there's like all these whole foods bags they keep holding up you know and it was just like one of the um one of the supporters that was there wrote a, a evidence ad nauseum because it was so repetitive of, of right. what the, it, it was just ridiculous and then the main cop who runs the drug task force sat up on the stand and lied he said that they had uh, had a um a tip about our house and then the the subsequent cops that they interrogated or that they questioned said no we never got any tips about that house so i mean he was caught in his lie on the stand and um and then it Nobody comes out finds that uh offensive i mean you know you would right. think the judge might want to throw somebody like that out for contempt but right uh, yeah they're all on the same team so um so they that was all they had and then uh we decided not to take the stand because um one of our well alex catherine's partner actually tried to do a directed verdict because they could not prove that the cannabis that they took from our house was of a high enough thc level to be classified as marijuana under the law and so technically they did not prove they did not provide evidence that what they accused us of having was actually what we had so he came up with this directed verdict and of course the judge denied it and um and then we moved on and that was even one of the questions that the jury asked after they went out for deliberation they came back and said did the state test for thc levels and they said no they didn't they just tested for the presence of thc yep. so um so that right there they didn't carry the burden of proof so that should in my opinion should have been the end of it but you know it wasn't so um and then we had a bunch of character witnesses come up even one of my youngest son's best friends got up on the stand and testified for us and um and, th and all that and, and um that in itself is hugely rare i've never seen or heard of a character witnesses allowed before sentencing so that was really evidence that that judge was giving you really what he could give you i mean yeah. aside from you know the judge really doesn't dismiss the case the prosecutor has well the judge can just can can just say throw it all out but i don't think many judges are going to do that on principle but the, that judge gave you an opportunity to demonstrate who you were in a way that i've never seen happen in a state court or a federal court or any court yeah she was i mean she was really nice to us the whole time other than the fact that she didn't grant the directed verdict which would have been fantastic but i mean like like she let it like we had to have a character witness list you know the, because if we, there were many times we thought we were going to trial and then we weren't and so we had the list that we'd turn in 10 days ahead of time you know and everything and and we just kept going through this cycle of these things and some of the witnesses were you know didn't weren't able to come so they let us substitute other ones and so they were they were very uh cooperative about that and and i appreciated that and um and then uh so so after everything was said and done um they went into deliberation and i think they deliberated for about 10 hours and they they did come back and ask about the you know did the state test for thc and they came back and asked um well i think it was something about the nullification but see the judge did not give them a written copy of the jury charges which catherine said i've never had that happen in court before you know why aren't you giving that and the judge says well i never give them the written jury jury charges so the jury was unclear on the whole nullification thing and they even told that the, the judge asked them after it was over why didn't you nullify the law and they said we didn't realize that we could yeah. so and, and apparently she apologized to them for not explaining it better so Oops. again i'm thinking uh maybe this could be grounds for an appeal or something i don't know yeah um but that's I, it was just and, and then there is i mean that feeling when they come back out there to read that verdict was just oh my god there couldn't be a more tense moment yeah yeah in my life of all the tense moments i've had in my life that when you got when I got the call it says they got a verdict and it was just like kaboom I mean it just couldn't yep I probably aged uh, uh, five years in that hour of of from the time that they told me there was a verdict till till the time that they told me I was guilty yeah <laughs> yep
Well, and what's um, weird is that we are not weird, but um, when we they asked these questions and they asked to hear the interviews and that's what they did was they asked to hear our interviews again. So they played our interviews with the cops again, and that was all right before we went to lunch and just the way that everything happened before we went to lunch, we went to lunch thinking, oh, this is swinging in our favor. We've got this. Everything's going to come out on our end. And even the bailiffs were saying that the longer the jury deliberates, the more chance of either a hung jury or a not guilty verdict. So yep. we really thought things were in our favor. So we came back. And when we got back, the prosecutor had offered us a plea deal of five years probation, um, I think a thousand dollar fine and community service and uh, take a drug class, which is so stupid. But um, whatever, you know, that's fine. So we were discussing that and it said something on there about firearm. It said no FA and they went back in. They were like, what does that mean? And hey, no firearms. They came back out and told us that. And when we were sitting there talking about it, they came back and said, there's a verdict. And so we didn't even have time to decide if we wanted to take this plea deal or not. Wow. They came back with the verdict and, um, you know, guilty on manufacturing and selling, not guilty on trafficking. So at least there's not that mandatory minimum hanging over us. Right. And, um, and once they read the verdict, uh, Catherine went up to the judge and said, you know, we had just been offered this plea deal. Would you please consider this as part of your, you know, punishment or you know the sentencing or whatever and you know of course the prosecutor was already like oh no no that's not admissible you know blah 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 yeah but you know it's like and this is something i want to say to the judge is that that shows that even the prosecutor didn't really want to put us in jail mm -hmm. so okay. um so i've got i did a typed statement that I, has already been sent to the judge and you know i'm just hoping that she because we had a lot of letters that were um sent and so i'm hoping that she'll read those but I'm working with someone else who is helping me, you know, get basically prepared what I want to say to the judge. And that's one of the things that I want to say is that, you know, the prosecutor didn't even want to put us in jail. Right. So, um, and then another thing too, is that the cop, the, the main cop on the case sat up on the stand and said that we victimized every citizen in the state of Georgia. Well, if that's the case, how is that a fair jury? You know? Right. Uh, there that's 14 of our victims sitting there exactly and, you know so in in my opinion anyone who lived in the state of georgia previous to uh 2018 or march 29 2018 is not a valid juror so i don't we'll we'll see what happens but um i'm hoping that we're not going to have to you know make make appeals or anything like that that the judge will see and, and that's one reason i kind of um wanted us to go ahead and go last week or whenever a couple of weeks ago, just because um, it will still be fresh in the judge's mind, you know, and now more time will go by and everything. But I mean, it's, I don't think they have many trials like ours. And so hopefully it won't have I, one from I'm her mind. I'm pretty confident that everything that happened in that trial is fresh in that judge's mind because what happened in your trial doesn't happen very often. Just like my trial, just like anybody who stands up and does the right thing. Those are not cookie cutter trials. They never yeah. are. And, and the judge remembers them every time. There's no way they don't. The judges, as much as many of them are assholes, they're typically not very dumb. And that's just yeah. a thing. Yeah. Well, and this judge has, uh, she's actually the first judge we were with from the very beginning. And then we rotated into other ones, but she, you know, and she was the one who granted us a continuance when I was really sick. And so I feel like, and I think she is a defense, I think she was a defense attorney because she's the one that's elected. She's not an appointed judge. She was, she's elected. And, um, and I think she really likes Catherine and Alex, but I think she kind of, you know, has that female attorney bond thing going with Catherine. So, oh. um, <laughs> so hopefully, you know, and the fact that she, I think has been a defense attorney will work in our favor too. But um, I think, feel like she's been fair so far and um hopefully we'll continue to be so with, with all of it but even like the pre-sentencing interviews that we did with the uh, probation that was their only their second pre-sentencing interview that they'd done because nobody ever goes to trial so right. exactly no you're spot on and you know like i said uh it you had some things happen that that were similar to some of the things that happened with me in the sense of just going through a bunch of things that didn't work and then all of a sudden you found somebody that was willing to to get in there and do the fortunately for me well i don't know if it was fortunate but my 
co-defendant's attorney was like your Catherine, did the things that my attorney wouldn't do, but she did them for the both of us. So it worked out. <laughs> and, uh, yep. you know, it, I, I think that the situation that you're in, I mean, we've come so far since like when my case was in 2011. And so the, the, the state of the law was so different, even in California. Um, and there was no hemp laws and there was no dispensaries on every corner. And there was no, you know, a lot of the things that are happening today weren't happening back then. So I, I, I couldn't feel stronger, even though it's just my feeling. And I know that doesn't help, but I, if I could have traded places with you, I would have done it in a second. So I think you're in a good, you're in a good position, but I think a lot of that has to do with the community support, which is, you know, really what we're all about. And that's what really, we've only got about six minutes left of the show. So I want to make sure you have time to address potential supporters and, and if there's a call to action that we can have time to go through that. So now that you're in a spot where when we talked of two or three weeks ago, you were getting sentenced the following Tuesday and then mm -hmm. your attorney got sick. It got continued out. When is your current sentencing date? Um, it's, it's either November 6th or 7th. I don't, they, those were the two dates they gave us a choice of, and I don't know if they've confirmed which one yet. Um, cause we said we could take either one. I personally prefer to go on the sticks, but that's just my preference. So, um, so we will find out. Yeah. It was actually supposed to be last Tuesday of the, the 10th. Yeah. So last Tuesday would have been the sentencing and, um, and basically any, any more letters that want to be that people, if they feel like writing, um, you know, things like that, I can, uh, I'll put the, have, the email for it. Here's <laughs> something that we've done in the past and it's been very helpful. And here's the deal for people who've never engaged. This is something that you don't have to know the person in depth to vouch for their character. You can know them from the story that they told and from the people that are vouching from them. And you can you can write a letter in sincerity and 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 speak to the points that you do know. And what we've done in the past is created a template that just sort of lays out the bullet points that you want to make sure that we cover and and maybe even points that you want to keep away from like you don't want to talk about the details of the trial you just want to talk about the character of the defendant and and the reason why they shouldn't go to jail and that's really it and and so if you were to put together um you know some sort of a template or or send over to me what you have we can put it up on our website we can post it up on our page and that way it gives people and maybe even a, a, an example or two of some of the letters that were written. That's what we've done. That's been very effective because a lot of people have never written a letter. A lot of people don't know what that is. A lot of people can't even friggin' write. But the point is, is you can and you can type it, you can write it. But the most important thing is that you're using your words. So if you get if you see a, a template, you know, don't copy it. But take those points and put them into your words and imagine what it would be like to 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 know kelly you know for 10 years and have this happen to your to your friend and and to know that um you know what you're doing could have a bearing on the outcome of her future and and i think it's really one of the things that everybody can do and i've seen you know hundreds of letters get written as a result of a call to action when the right people uh, when you can make it easy enough for them and they can get their head around your story which i think we've done here and and you know um I, i'm sure that you'll make yourself available if somebody has a question to ask you or whatnot so um if you can do that and get that to me i'll make sure that we get it out in front of everybody um so i i think you know in my opinion the more letters we can get, the better. And and I will certainly write a letter on your behalf and and I will do it the way I would want somebody to do it for me. And it's it's really a thing that I, I can't tell you how powerful it is. Like if you've never written a letter for somebody else, knowing that a judge is going to read it, a judge will read this if you get it to them in time. They do, they do, they read every single time. 
and and I have written dozens of letters on uh, on, on behalf of people that I've known or not known, um, and and all spectrum. And I just there's there's a feeling that you're really actually doing something. And I just you know for anybody who's thought about being an activist or or or, or taking a step and doing something meaningful, um, this is really one of the most aside from being a juror. This is probably the next most powerful thing you can do that can directly impact a, a, a human being's freedom. So I, I'm going to implore you. I'm I will do it, and I'll put, I'll send it to you. And please share it if you if you if you have a mind to it. Um, um, and I'll I'll send you the hard copy of it. Um, you know, probably before the weekend. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. So um, one, one big thing is to our oldest son, I mean, excuse me, my youngest son, he's 21 now, but he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum and uh, he got a job with my husband and at his company, at the company where they work. And I think it would he have just a terrible impact on him if we were taken away from here. And uh, we don't want that to happen because he's getting so much better with just so many aspects of his life. And he's got severe PTSD too from this. So mm -hmm. as does my older child, but Rowan especially. So that's something I really want to emphasize and just appeal to the judge as a mother and as a daughter with a, I, my own mother is ailing and, and not doing well. So just, you know, those types of things too, just the, 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 the larger impact it will have. And put all those bullet points together so that we can, uh, uh, you know, hopefully everybody will take them and assemble it on their own, their own way. But that's the key to have those, those points that somebody who knows you would know that. Right. And, and that's an important, those are very important factors that I think a judge who this judge seems to have all the elements of a human being. <laughs> so not all judges have that. My judge didn't, right. but 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 this one seems to so if if, if we can uh, appeal and um, Becca our vice president is is all over it she's she says get me the info and I'm on it so um, the sooner you get it it'll be published on our website and we'll do everything we can to get as many people as we can to engage and who knows what that means but I know that if we don't do it it won't mean anything this way and at least <laughs> it'll mean a few of us will get out there hopefully a lot. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And so does my husband. He's I just had a long day at work and couldn't be on tonight, but um, but well, he's well, we appreciate listen, it. You guys are welcome to 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 join me anytime. And I don't know if you would like, but I have um some of these solidarity ribbons that we've always wanted to court. Yeah, I love those. Yeah. We'd love to send you a package that has some of those and some of our stuff. Um, and it's it's just a uh, I've I have watched when a courtroom fills up and everybody's well behaved and well dressed and respectful and wearing these ribbons that it has had a meaningful impact so much so that I've seen prosecutors blow a gasket. I mean, <laughs> and 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 for that alone, I wear them. But, right. <laughs> but 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 also I've watched everybody takes notice and the judge especially takes notice and it works when everybody's mindful and everybody's respectful. So just make sure everybody knows if you're going to put this ribbon on, you got to, you, you, you got to walk in, you know, a team, you got to do this right. Yep. So give me your address and everything that I need. And I'll, I'll put a package together and get it out to you by the weekend. All right. Thank you, Joe. All right, Kelly. Well, um, you know, our hearts with you. I appreciate you coming on. You're welcome to join the show anytime. Um, if you got something you want to share or anything, just you got the link. So from Wednesday from eight to nine, your time, you could pop on at any time and just we'll we'll make room for you. Well, thank you. I will say I was feeling a, a, a very hopeless um, a couple of weeks ago when uh, when Chris Rayleigh told me about this and I tuned in two weeks ago. I felt so much better after that. And then you came on to our thing that Friday night and I just, you've really given me a lot of hope and I appreciate that so much. Well, fantastic. And that, that, that gives me the, the juice to keep going because sometimes you wonder if it's doing any good and other mm -hmm. times you, you, you hear that it is and, and it, and it fills your tank up and you say, you know, you keep going. So um, yeah. we're here for you and 
I, I certainly hope that uh, when this is all said and done, you'll remember us and you'll keep helping. Oh, absolutely. I, my name means uh, Warrior Maiden, and I never really knew why I was given this name until five and a half years ago, and now I'm on it. So I'm, I'm going to have to meet my wife. Warrior. She's another one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm ready. I'm ready to help others because I don't want anyone else to ever have to go through this. Well, fantastic. We'll worry about that after your sentencing. Right. <laughs> Let's worry about you right now. And yeah. uh, well, um, you, you have a contact or anything. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, how would they do it? Um, well, my uh, I'm on Facebook, Kelly Elizabeth. I'll, I'll comment on this uh, after it's Facebook Live, uh, okay. after it's posted. And my email, if if you want to write it down, is scarlet, S-C-A-R-L-E-T, begonias, like the flowers, uh, five zero at gmail.com. Perfect. Perfect. All right, Kelly. Well, again, um, get me the information. I'll get you what I said. And, um, you know, we're going to do everything that can be done. And I can see a positive outcome. And I just want to get the world to reality. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Speak it into existence. So that's yeah, what we're okay. going to do. <laughs> all right, Craig. Well, I've sort of stomped all over your talking time today. So why don't you give us the final words here? Well, I can tell you that the people that listen to our show are the people that actually care. They actually get it in terms of the cannabis criminal justice and such. But over and again, we hear from them. What can I do? What can I do? Well, I can tell you absolutely positively judges are influenced by letters that people send to the sentencing judge for the purpose of sentencing so when you put that uh, on the website i'm asking our listeners all the listeners please go on there please write a simple letter put your forever stamp on it and let it go <laughs> absolutely all right guys well that's it for this week i want to thank everybody that's been on the show I've been really engaged with Kelly, so I haven't been able to talk to all the listeners very much, but um, appreciate you being here, and uh, we'll do this again next week. Stay tuned for the information about getting a letter for Kelly. Let's do this. All right, folks, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night.